laugh, so forget you. Anyway, all right. Uh, uh, so um, we're going to start this year off in uh, a little bit of a, um, of a different way. Who remembers what our theme last year was? Say it like you know it. All right, that was kind of weak. Say it like you know it. There we go. What did Jesus do? And this year we're going to be focusing a little different way. Okay, we're going to talk about how we get wisdom and how we use wisdom. But let me tell you why. So have you ever noticed how change different sometimes comes in threes, right? So the first year, like let's say like when I was here, my first year here, I was nervous, right? You know, I'm here, I'm here working with peace. Your spiritual development is my priority and it still is. I'm like, can I do this? Am I supposed to do this? Okay. Then the second year, something happens. You get a little bit more confidence, right? So now I kind of get into the flow. I'm like, I know how to do this. I used to spend like all day Friday and Saturday getting ready for Sunday. Now I got a little bit of, of a flow, Matthew. You know, I can, I can do some things Saturday, Saturday morning, and I'm able to get some things done maybe even faster because of the flow that I'm in. Now we're in the third year. And in the third year, what I'm paying attention to is not only me, but also you and trying to do it at the same time together. And when I think about the questions, like when we have had the, the fishbowl and we still have it, and I'm going to invite you all, I'm inviting you all to remember, I want you to write questions down. If you want to email them to me, you can. But when we had the fishbowl, have paper, write it down, put it in there, because we want to address your questions. We want to be relevant when we're talking to you. But in the third year, Talasia, I'm thinking about the way you all think in particular about your walk with God, the way you think in particular about who you are in the kingdom of God, the way you think in particular about who you are as a person and how we see ourselves in this world, okay? And so this is one of the reasons why we started with this scripture, okay, looking at Genesis 19. This scripture, what it symbolically represents, what it symbolically represents, people, a family being told to leave a city that's being destroyed and don't look back. And when we looked, we saw what happened. Somebody looked back. Somebody literally turned around and looked back and what happened? They became a pillar of salt. Got stuck. That was it. Finito. Over. You're out of here. So we're going to talk about starting this semester. My first sermon with you all is freedom in relationship with God. That there is freedom when you are in relationship with God. And the scripture that we're going to look at is Luke 17. So I want you to turn to Luke 17. For those who, 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 who have Bibles or who have your smart devices, I want you to turn to Luke 17. Now, the verses that we're going to concentrate on and focus on today is going to be verses 21 through 33. But what I want to do with you all is I want us to walk through what happened here in Luke 17 before we get to verses 21 through 23, okay? Okay. So when you have Luke 17, remember it's the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book in the New Testament. When you have it, let me hear you say amen. amen. Okay. Let, oh, when I said I asked y'all to have it. I didn't even have it. Look, boy, see. Ooh, boy, see, look at that. Uh -huh, see, I see you laughing at me. Well, it's just like black people. That's what y'all do. Just la laugh at a brother, kick me while I'm just playing. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, here we go. What I'm not going to do, I'm not going to read through all of the verses. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But what I'm going to do is give you a synopsis. So first, I want us to look at verses 1 through 6. Verses 1 through 6. In my Bible, that, that passage is called Jesus Teaches Forgiveness. And Jesus talks about forgiveness. He talks about when someone does something to you, you forgive them. Seven times, it doesn't matter. However many times that someone does something to you, you are to forgive them. Because forgiveness is really about you, not about the person that you are forgiving. And then when you get to verse 5, one of the apostles, and the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. So we understand that forgiveness is real, but increase our faith. And what did he say to them in verse 6? And the Lord said, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, which is a mulberry tree, be thou plucked up by the root and be thou planted in the sea and it should obey you. Okay, now table there and then we're going to go to the next stream of verses, which is verse 7 through 10. And in verses 7 through 10, Jesus talks about a servant's duty. What does it mean to be a servant? And what I like about this passage is he's really talking to them about the person who has the servant working for them. And he was like, so when Alicia comes to you 
when she's done with this part of her job, are you going to be waiting for her to like give her meat and everything for, for, for her to eat? Or are you going to be looking at her like there's actually more for her to do? Because while she may think she's completed the job, you as the person who has to work for her realize that there's more for her to do. So what's your posture when you complete a task? All right. Then we go to the next stream of verses. That's verses 11 through 19. And this is where Jesus heals 10 lepers. Okay, Jesus comes into uh, Samaria and Galilee, and there were 10 individuals. I don't know if they were all men or all women or a mix, but they had leprosy. And they came to Jesus, asking him to heal them. And Jesus gave them this instruction to go, go to the elders, to go to the temple. And as they walked, as they followed his instruction, they walked. It's like basically like recognizing that I got leprosy, and as I'm walking to the window, he said, go to the window, I'm walking, and I get healed as I'm walking to the window like like I'm changing as I'm walking. And only one of the people who came to Jesus came back. Only one of them who came to Jesus came back, one out of the 10. Now what I want to do, before going to 21 to 33, let's go back to the beginning of Luke 17. Luke 17, Jesus teaches on forgiveness. And when he used the reference, when he talked about having the faith, the size of a mustard seed. I want you to ask yourself right now, and, and you see what I have written up there. Notice when other people use this reference, especially when we talk about it in church, it's usually about getting you out of trouble. It's never to take you to the next level. Having the faith the size of a mustard seed, since when you're going through something, you have a faith the size, faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain because you basically need to move something out of your way. But we don't talk about it as far as you going to the next level, going up. It's always about you getting out of trouble. It's never having that faith to progress. It's having that faith to survive. No, that's not how Jesus used it. Number two, a servant's duty. Just because you accomplish your job doesn't mean you are entitled to anything. Check your posture when you complete your task. Because you know, or sometimes you don't know better than anyone else, when you think that you've done your job, there's actually more that you can do. But that's what Jesus is saying. He's talking to them like, when you think you've done your job, that means you stay in the servant's place. Don't ever get too big. Like me, when I'm done with the sermon, it don't mean that my job is done. Because what happens if Maya needs some help? If I got the big head and think, Psh, you're like, that's it. Won't you go talk to your mom? Really? Like, I thought that I was supposed to be able to come to you. I thought you said that you were a resource. You see what happens? But that's what happens to us when we think we've done something so great. So he's telling them, stay in your place. And then number three, Jesus heals 10 lepers. Now, how many came back to thank him? One. I want you to notice something. That one who came back got something that the other nine completely missed. That one who came back got something that the other nine missed. Because when they came back, I love it. Let me see. Let me find it right here. When Jesus gets here and Jesus answering, where, ah, here we go. Verse 17. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? They are not found that return to give glory to God except this stranger, or save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith have made thee whole. See, what the, per what the other nine don't understand is that the reason you were whole wasn't just because Jesus healed you. The reason you were whole is because you had to do something in order for you to be healed. And so when we walk away, if you don't realize that it, something had to be enacted or triggered in you, for you to receive your healing, then you think that it's just a matter of me going up to Talasia, let's say, who's giving out blessings today. And hey, can you heal me today? And she goes, sure, I can heal you today. Go to the health center and get some drugs and you'll be okay. <laughs> and people think that that's where the healing comes from, not that it came from something that they did. So when we talk about church, I want us to think about something. How you think impacts how you see the world. How you think impacts how you see yourself. How you think impacts how you treat other people and how you think informs how you pursue or don't pursue something. It's the thought, how you think about it. Now let's look, since we are, I think, a, a, either a majority black or African American you know, congregation um, uh, today, but I would say this even if we were mixed and we had a little sprinkle sprinkle here and there, we good, you know, because that's just how I am, you know what I'm saying? You know, if, if we had a, little, a whole critical mass, a little sprinkle sprinkle. Okay, cool, all right. For us in our country, in this country, in the U.S. of A., We've gone through hell in this country. And we're still going through it now. We still are. And when you go through stuff, sometimes you have to do what you have to do to survive so that you can make it through to the next day. 
And if you look at how we approach church, especially when our communities were becoming more established, we didn't necessar necessarily approach church from an empowered position or even at times a very well informed position or an educated position. We approach church in a survival position. We just want to make it through the week. We just want to make it through the day. So when we heard the word, it was always very inspirational, you know, but I'm not so sure it was very informational. So what I want to say is that if you think about the way you grew up in church, I want to ask you this, and this is a rhetorical question, but I want you to think. Did you grow up in church where you spent more time talking about being loved or how bad of a sinner you really were and how you need God in order for you to be better? Now, one of the things I, I noticed, because I, I see some people thinking, maybe I should wait another 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So... I'm sure that some of you may have heard the, the, the good part, but I know a lot of us in here know what sin is. Or we think we know what sin is. Or we think we know what a sinner is, and we definitely probably feel like I am a sinner. Now, let's talk about me for a minute. I, you know, I don't like to do it, but I got to do it because I like putting myself out on front street. So y'all good with that? Cool. That, that my man. He said, I'm good. Matthew, lately, something has happened to me within the last year and a half. Okay, I'm going to use this story to explain why we're talking about this this way, okay? My company has changed. I used to hang out with people who made 20, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 dollars. You know, making, you know, the same same amount of money. Let's say it's called that middle class, Karen. It's called that middle class, if you will. Not the 20 and 30. That's in poverty. That's in poverty. But once you get to 40, 50, 60, 70, that's middle class. So now I'm hanging out with people who make $100,000, $150,000, $250,000, $500,000 a year, and a million dollars a year. And I'm not exaggerating. My company has changed some. Now, I still hang out with the 40, 50, 60, okay? But hanging out with the 150, the 500K, and the million, it's like, whoa. And I start paying attention to what they say and what they talk about. I pay attention to what they say and what they talk about. Now, obviously, people who make this amount of money, if they're humble, one thing that you know they got of is a lot of paper. A lot of paper. Alicia, here's one of the things that I noticed. People who usually are in that tax bracket, because that's a different tax bracket, don't waste a lot of time talking about when they were poor or being poor or being impoverished. They don't waste a lot of time. Matter of fact, they hardly spend any time dwelling on it. I didn't say they don't ever talk about it but they don't dwell on it, right? Let me tell you why. Because they understand that they have, in some cases, escaped or been promoted to a new level. Why would I look back at where I came from and dwell on that when I'm in, I'm in a new place and I'm at a new level? So what they do is they may reflect on where they came from. They may look back every now and then, but they don't turn all the way around. You starting to understand why Lot's wife turned to a pillar of salt? See, they don't turn around and look at something that's, that's being destroyed, that's destructible. They do what the Samaritan did. I come back and thank you so I can go back to do something else. But I don't turn back 100% to those ways. I don't turn back, especially when I was told not to turn back. So what I want to ask you now is in church, why do we spend so much time talking about sin? When we serve the one who basically took sin out of this world. When we serve the one who actually showed us how much God really loves us by the sacrifice that he gave, who, who was the one who, who, who explained to us that it's not just about what you do to earn God's love because it's not about that. God already loves you. It's about how do you become who God wants you to be? Because what I'm saying is now I want to use an example. If you, as you get older and you go to other churches, you'll start to see that they probably have a lot of different ministries. They have a, a building ministry. They have a single ministry. They have a marriage ministry. They have all these ministries. The ministry that I sometimes like to pay attention to is the single ministry. And I'll tell you why. Because I don't understand how you have a single ministry in eight to ten years to people who are in that ministry are still in that ministry. I don't understand that. They're still in the ministry. They're still in the ministry. I didn't, I'm not tripping on them still being single. They're still in the ministry. See, the other thing Jesus didn't do, he never taught in a way for people to be dependent on him. He was always trying to get you to go outside because he understood it wasn't about me per se, it was about the one who sent me. 
It was always about God who sent me. It was never about him per se. It was always about the one who sent him. So what I'm saying is, is that if we are sitting in churches in particular, and if we're not reaching you and teaching you how to become fully dependent on God so that you're not dependent on us, then what happens when you graduate and when you leave? What happens when you're out there? See? And as African-American people in particular in this country who've been beat up on a lot, I don't know if we realize we bring that beat up on mentality in the church too. And we take that same beat up mentality to work. And we take that same beat up mentality when we're exercising our talents. And that same beat up talent when we're conversing with our friends. You see, instead of walking in victory and walking in liberation, we're walking imprisonment. We're walking handcuffed. We're mentally shackled. And we don't even realize it because we're doing what we were taught. And Jesus came to liberate us from that. He came to de-shackle that. He came to tear that down, but it's hard when all we want to focus on is sin. And here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying I want to enable you to dwell in sin, and sin is anything that separates you from God. I'm not saying we will not talk about sin, because that is not it either. But what I am saying is, you ever notice that when you dwell on something, you don't actually stop doing it? So why do I want to talk to you about your sexual immorality all the time or your sexual sin so you can continue doing it? And what do I mean by sexual immorality? I'm not talking about orientation. I'm talking about how you treat other people when you're engaging with people sexually. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that, okay? Because I know some people probably, where is he going with that? Mm -mm. I'm talking about how you treat people when you're in relationship with them. You can tear people down thinking that you were in love when you're really just in lust. And I know it feels good. That's how God designed it. But is it good for you long term? Maybe for the first five minutes, but the next 30, oh no. And next 30 years, no. <laughs> you said, have mercy. <laughs> yeah, more than five minutes. That's on y'all. I ain't going to dwell on that. I'm recording myself. On to the next one. Okay, all right? Okay. I want you to understand that, okay? And I really want people, to, and I want to be clear about that so people understand what is my position. Total advocate and support, period. Okay, and I will continue to be and always be. What happens when we talk about how we tithe in church? People hold tithing over your head, don't they? But they don't teach you how to tithe. They don't even teach you the history of tithing. So you're going to hold that over my head and make me feel bad for not giving, but you haven't even taught me how to give. Or then we talk about sin. You shouldn't be living this way. You shouldn't be living that way. You shouldn't be doing this. Well, then help me understand not only that I shouldn't be doing it, but why? So that I can make a sustainable shift in my life and do something different. Because it's only sustainable when you take it on yourself. It is not sustainable when I'm standing over you trying to peel your skull back, pouring knowledge in. It's sustainable when you take it. What the disciples did wasn't sustainable. Notice why Jesus was there. It was after Jesus left. And then their faith became real when the Holy Spirit came to dwell with them. And then it was like, oh, oh, I get it. Oh, I got it now. Oh, they can't stop me. They can't, I'm, I'm not scared of death anymore, but see, something had to change within them. So now let's go to Luke 17, verses 21 through 33. And I have key verses in particular that I just want us to look at as I work to break them open. 21 through 23, 26 through 29, 32 through 33. And then after this, I made my final points and I'm done. Luke 17, 21 through 23. And I'll just read... Um, 22 to, to, no, no, actually, no, I'm going to read 21 through 23. Neither shall they say, lo, here or lo, there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. What he's saying is they won't look over there and say, that's the kingdom of God. They won't look here and say, this is the kingdom of God, because the kingdom of God, Cassidy, is inside of you. So he's saying, and he said unto the disciples, the days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you shall not see it. And they shall say to you, see here or see there, go not after them, don't follow them. So I'm not going to tell you, queen, go over there, that's the kingdom of God. Don't follow that. You see what I'm saying? He's, he, he's telling them, don't follow that. But see, that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were trying to show you what the kingdom of God looked based on what you gave and how you acted. But he's like, no, 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 it's, it's more to it than that. Verse 26 through 29. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Back up here. Look at Noah and look at the other people. What happened? 
Noah was given a commandment to build an ark. And you know it took him a long time to build it. I think they said it was, what, 170 years or something like that before they were even able to get on the ark. So how long was he actually building that ark? I don't know. But I do know some things were happening. You've seen it depicted in poor depictions, or you can read it in the scripture. While he's building, people walking about talking. Look at that dude. What is he doing? Look at him. He's crazy. He's building a boat on dry land. That makes no sense. And I love what it said. It said they married, they drank. That meant they went on with their lives. They did whatever they wanted. And they enjoyed their life. And some people can look at them and go, see, they enjoying the fruits of God. They living in the kingdom of God. And Jesus was saying, no, because what happened? They died. <laughs> no, no one lived. So while you're looking for kingdom look, you know, to look like it's always pristine and immaculate and tight, Jesus was like, no, it's not always going to look like that. So don't be fooled. 32 through 33. And then that's it with at least this scripture. 32 through 33. He says, and he just gave it to you plain. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall you lose, lose his life shall preserve it. Saving your life. What do I mean by saving your life? The people who work to accumulate things, they're going to lose it. Because when you think you own something, it, it really owns you. We fight more to protect what we are purchasing, but really, it's, it, 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 it got you. you know? Like you got a new flat screen TV, right? Most of y'all probably grew up never had a flat screen TV. Now all of a sudden, we got a flat screen TV. Now, my attitude changed towards that flat screen TV. To ladies, don't look at the screen TV too hard. You know, I don't want you to take away any of the vision and any of my pixels. You know, don't, don't, don't touch it. Hold on. Here, 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 here's the remote. Do it from here. Hit that one button. Girl, you're hitting all the buttons. You're about to break my daggone teeth. You see how it changes? But see, when I grew up, we had click of the click. Most of my life, we didn't even have this. Now I got a flat screen. The boy, I look at that thing, and I'm just like, yeah, yeah, that, yeah them pictures do look good. Boy, that high def. I sure saw my boy get his neck broke on that field. It, I feel bad for him, but boy, that was a bad scene. You know what I'm saying? That was a bad play. You know, I enjoy it, but what happens if and when I need some money, and maybe I'm out of money, and I could probably sell my TV for $400? Should I sell it? Can I sell it? <laughs> no, man, I got to hold on to that TV. See, when you try to accumulate and only save yourself, you lose yourself. And Jesus is saying when you let go of this world to lose your life, you actually save yourself. Because the stuff of this world isn't real. This isn't going to sustain you. You have to be willing to lose your life. But the only way you can lose your life in peace is not by looking at yourself like you're not worthy of it. Like there's something wrong with me. Like God doesn't love me. You can't do what God has called you to do if you walk around with that kind of an attitude. And the other thing that you can't do is help somebody else. You can hurt people doing that kind of stuff. That's why Jesus always talked to the Pharisees the way that he did. Like, hey, what y'all are teaching, that's not it. That's not it. This is it. So these are my final points right here. Freedom in relationship with God. Freedom. There's a freedom that surpasses all understanding. I'll describe it to you this way. How many people in here got a best friend? Okay, we got a best friend. Sometimes our best friend is a parent, it's a sibling, it's a friend. Okay? Let me ask you, just by head nod, is one of the reasons that person's your best friend because you can be who you are around them and don't have to hide anything? I don't know why people don't think that's the relationship with God that you're supposed to have. See, for some of you all who probably yell obscenities at times when you're probably not around the doc's presence or when you're at a probate or something or when you're at your friends at a late night party and y'all are drinking, you know you're not behaving like a Christian, but you look like one, but you know you're not behaving like one. It's okay. When you come around that friend and Catherine, you probably just finish saying, yeah, that, mm, that friend doesn't immediately go, what you say that for? They go, girl, what's up? I hear what you're saying. Girl, what was going on? They're not judging what you said yet. Okay, you love being around that person because you can be who you are. But the other great thing about that friend is they can check you because they have a relationship with you, Catherine. Yo, girl, don't say shouldn't be cussing out here like that. You know what I'm saying? Like other people out here watching. Girl, I, I feel your anger. I feel it. But you know, let's wait till we get in the room around four four walls. You know, ain't nobody watching. You know, and you know, and, and let's drink some water and have a conversation. Okay, <laughs> let's wash down the other stuff that probably got you feeling kind of froggy, like you want to jump. Don't leap. That's the wrong leap of faith to take. You know what I'm saying? You know, like Catherine, hey girl, you know I love you. You know, and, and, I, and I fight with you. But if you leap, you're gonna leap alone. And they're gonna fight you better than I can fight with you because I ain't gonna be there anyway. You, you see what I'm saying? 
That friend can check you. For all intents and purposes, it's, it's an oversimplification, but that's the relationship. That's one way you have your relationship with God is. God knows you how you are. And God knows you how you are because God made you and because God cares. So why are we always walking around talking about how unworthy we are? I understand what God did. I'm not worthy of it. I understand that. But because God did it, I know that I'm worthy of it. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing I did to earn it. It's because of how God feels about me. That's why. So here's the thing. If I know that with God, there's always a way, I'm free. See, I can walk in that. And you can't tell me anything different. If I know that there's a way with God, I'm free. And here's the thing. Think about your finances. Think about how you feel when you have money in the bank. Malik, don't you always feel like when you got money in the bank? Yeah, I, I go to McDonald's if I feel like it today. Yep, yep. I go to Subway if I feel right, right, man. I, I can, I can, you know, you know what? We gonna, bro, right? We gonna go see a movie afterwards. It's only eight dollars. I got a hundred in the bank, so I spend it. It's just gonna be nine or two left. You wanna go get something to eat after that? Okay, let's go over here. It's only gonna be twelve dollars, so that's twenty dollars. I still got eighty dollars in the bank. But what happens when you look and you like, Lord, they got number five dollars in the bank, <laughs> and I don't get paid until next month, and I got two weeks to go. Whoa, how do you make $5 last 14 days? I know it's possible. <laughs> I know it's possible. I know it's real. That's what, that's, that's on the 40 cent a day. I'm, I'm praying for you hard right now. 40 cent a day. That means when you breathe, you got to pay a penny. <gasps> Lord, I got to hold my breath for 39 more breaths. Jesus, you know what I'm saying? Abundance. Now let's talk about abundance. I've been talking about this too. Abundance. Didn't Jesus say, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more? Abundance is not about resources. Abundance starts when you're totally dependent on God. See, Jesus knew where everything came from. As a matter of fact, as I said, Jesus always referenced who sent him. And we'll talk about this later. There's a difference between being called and being sent. Jesus wasn't called to anything. Jesus was sent. Paul was called. Moses was called. Peter and all them were called. Mary was called. Jesus was sent. It's completely different when you sent. But Jesus understood abundance start when you're totally dependent on God. Then when you're totally dependent on God, you don't have the same worries as everybody else because you know God going to take care of you. That's why it made sense to Jesus when he told him about, look at the birds in the air. They're not worrying. What you worrying for? Why? That's why you can say we can forgive. Don't be afraid of the people who can hurt your body. Be afraid of the one who can move or do something with your soul. Don't be afraid of this because this ain't nothing but a shell. He understood that as radical and as crazy as it is to some people, I believe it's the truth. Now, here's the other thing when you're free in relationship. And this is something I know sometimes some of you may struggle with because I've gotten questions about this. Read this last statement. I'm going to read it for you. Being free in my faith as a Christ follower also liberates me to be interested in, curious about, inspired by, even motivated by other faith traditions without losing my home in Christ. See, because see, when you are based and anchored in Christ, you'd be surprised where you can learn some wisdom from. You'd be surprised how God can talk to you through a song. See, God don't only have to talk to you through the Bible. God don't only have to talk to you through a Kirk Franklin song or a Kier Sherry or Tasha Cobb. God could talk to you through a Lupe Fiasco song. God could talk to you through a D1 song. Obviously a Lecrae. God, in my case, you know, I, I love the God talked to me through an outcast song. That's still my number one favorite group in the world. Tribe Called Quest. Like, I like that kind of hip hop. God spoke to me through that because those are the things that sustained me. It was strange at a time when I wasn't even a Christian anyway. But for some reason, there was a music that was telling me, be positive, embrace being black, love yourself, love your community. Don't have too much pride in yourself because you're not perfect. Like hip hop songs said this to me. I'm like, man, Wu-Tang said, you know, said, said that too. Like that's how they sounded. And when somebody else would be like, don't listen to that because of this, this and that. And I'd be like, well, sometimes these, these, these gospel artists, artists are singing one thing, but they could be living another way too. But guess what? It's not my position to judge whatever they're doing. This is about my relationship with God. And that's what Jesus was doing. This is about your relationship. This is about you. So what I'm saying as I bring this to a close now, it's okay to look back. You know the story of saying Kofa? I hope you do. And if you were friends with Mama Thorpe, I know you know that story. If you're sitting in the cultural center looking at any of these symbols around here, you should know that story. It's okay to look back. But the question is, does looking back fuel you or does it burden you? Lot's wife turned around and she got stuck. 
A lot of us keep turning around and we keep getting stuck. That's why we love dwelling on sin. A lot of us love turning around and getting stuck. That's why we love talking about how unworthy we are. A lot of us turn around and love getting stuck, and that's why we love talking about, look at what God has done for me. And no disrespect to the sister who said this, because you know, but I'm so thankful to, to, to be alive. That's great. We got a lot more things to be thankful for. Because here's what I want you to understand, that there is a blessing in death too. So while some of us go, because I'm alive, God is with me, understand. I believe healing can also come when people transition into the next realm. So that's why I'm saying the words that we use should reflect how we feel. Now, I said this yesterday to, to a friend as I'm going over this, and they were like, that was deep. You know, you got to break that down a little bit more. And I was like, no, nah, because I'm preaching to geniuses. You know, I was like, I'm preaching to people who are in a spirit of learning. Like, that's the position that y'all are in. I can tell. That's why y'all are sitting here like this and nobody's sleeping. And because I'm doing this in under 30 minutes. Uh-huh. <laughs> But for the next four Sundays, and we're going to continue, I'm going to ask these questions right here. Is your past lifting you up or holding you down? Is it fueling you or informing you or is it burdening you? Is it an opportunity to show where you can go and like I can go because I'm not there anymore or is it a crutch that keeps you stuck? Two, relationship. What's your relationship like with God? What's your relationship like with each other? What's your relationship like with yourself? I'm going to talk about that. Three, what is your purpose in any given moment? Now, we are all servants, okay, of God. We, 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 we are servants. We are as followers of Christ. That's, that is what we are. But that's also the position that we're to be in at all times. So even when you're on stage, bro, we servants. Even when we're on Snapchat, we servants. Even when we hang with our friends, we servants. Even when we're sitting in class, we angry. I mean, we servants. Um, you know, sorry, sorry. You know, even when you're sitting in the, it's when, when you're sitting in, in the dining hall, you servants. You may be starving, but you are servants. And then last but not least is a new place. How do you discern when people are speaking from fear or from caring? So that when you are moving to that next level, you don't get too sucked into if they're speaking from fear. And you don't also get too big of a head if they're speaking from caring. Because you still remember whose relationship is important for you? Yours. It's your relationship. And the only way you can get this to me is by having a relationship with Jesus. Because Jesus was the only one who spoke about a relationship with God in a way that was not oppressive. In a way that was not oppressive. It was not about you earning God's love, but it was about you accepting God's love. It's not about you putting something on the altar when Jesus is the lamb on the altar. Now accept me and then other doors will be open to you and you can continue to move through because I love you. And with that love, I'm going to mold you and change you and shift you and make something wonderful, even more wonderful out of you because I don't make no junk. God doesn't make junk. So if I know that God didn't make junk in me, I know God didn't make none in you. And you're younger than I am. You're prettier than I am. You're more handsome than I am. So I know that if I'm not junk, then you're not junk. I'm smart, you're smart. I'm worthy, you're worthy. I'm cool, you're cool. I'm straight, you're straight. I'm fresh, you're fresh. But it's not, I'm straight, and because you don't do it the way I do, you are all right. It's not that because I'm tight and you don't dress as good as I do, you're a little loose. It's not that I'm fresh and maybe on that day, and especially we're talking to one of our homeless brothers or sisters. Oh, because I'm fresh because I got access to a clean tub and shower. When I see you, you're not worthy because you're dirty. Excuse me? There's a reason he said that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Be careful. But be careful not to treat yourself like you the last. Just don't, and make sure, and I don't think, but see, here's the thing with, with us, I think in particular, you don't necessarily have to worry about us all the time putting ourselves first. Because internalized oppression and internalized racism really hurts that anyway, for most of us. But don't put yourself first. But please don't put yourself last. And Jesus is saying, don't do that to yourself. So 